Welcome to Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman. You're about to make the jump from the dishonest mainstream media into free and independent thought from key thought leaders on the subjects of culture, causes, politics, and faith. Welcome to Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman. My guest today is Thomas Lynch. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here, Reed. Thank you. All right, so uh, I want to introduce my audience to you real quick because I uh, I really think that uh, the conversation we're going to have today I think is really relevant, but also too you happen to just be on the regular a uh, a Renaissance man of a of an interesting type. So you are a mortician, you're an author, and you're a poet. Uh, you've written multiple books. Among them is the Undertaking: Life Studies from the Dismal Trade. Obviously, speaking of being a mortician, so we're going to jump into a little bit of that today. Uh, and then your uh, two newest works: you have the Deposition, New and Selected Essays on Being and Ceasing to Be. And then in about a week, you'll have Bone Rosary, which is uh, which is coming out. So uh, very excited about that. Uh, before we, before we jump into some of the questions I wanted to ask you, would you, uh, since you are just a week away from releasing Bone Rosary, would you would you tell us a little bit about that that book and what we can expect if we if we read it? I'd be happy to. Um, this is what it looks like. And it's a uh, pre-publication uh, advanced reader copy version. Yeah. And um, I'm grateful to the host of David Argo Dean in uh, Boston for bringing it out. Uh, a selected poems for uh, an internationally unknown uh, poet such as myself <laughs> is, um, is uh, at least I, I can say for me, it feels like having a collected works done because it takes the poems that I've been writing since, well, for 40 years of, of writing. And uh, it gathers up the five or six collections of poetry that I'd published before. It gathers up the poems I most liked out of that and puts them with, I think, 40 new ones and uh, publish them all in one place. So it's like having the best of the Kingston trio. Or yeah, that's great. Okay, and um, I, I do have to ask this because this is uh, this is something you actually write about. I believe it's in the undertaking. So I've read a couple of different things from you. So they might uh, run together a little bit. But I believe you talk about how you began uh, your, uh, or at least your family began their their trade in the in the mortician uh, uh, racket, if you want to call it that. <laughs> but um, I. I I'm just, I'm curious if, uh, uh, I, so I've read it and I've he actually heard you speak about it multiple times. So I'm well familiar with the story, but I think it's an interesting story nonetheless. So how did your family get started being morticians? Well, if it's the story I'm thinking, I, there's only, I mean, there's only one true fact of this matter. And that's that um, when my father was a boy, um, his uh, uncle uh, was ordained a priest and the uncle had survived the Spanish flu in 1917, uh, whereupon his mother said, God must have bigger plans for you, whence his vocation to the priesthood, apparently. Anyway, after his ordination, he was sent immediately out to uh, New Mexico, where the high dry air of the Sangre de Cristo mountains was reckoned to, to uh, assist him health-wise and get uh, more time out of his uh, priesthood for the bishop's sake. And uh, that seemed to be going fine. He loved uh, Taos, New Mexico, where he worked with indigenous people, mostly Apaches, uh, in those, um, in those uh, mission parishes around uh, that part of the world. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, he got sick and died uh, of a chesty uh, pneumonia and the uh, Apaches brought him down the valley of the Rio Grande to Santa Fe uh, in a buckboard where he was brought to the bishop for whom he worked. The bishop took one look at the corpse, had a, a hasty requiem and put him on uh, a train and sent him back to Jackson, Michigan collect whence he came. And um, when he got to Jackson, Agents of the Denoyer Funeral Home, the Catholic funeral uh, home in town, uh, had picked him up, took him to their premises. And the next morning, my father, 
12 years old at the time, uh, went with his father, my grandfather, to make arrangements for my grandfather's brother, the dead priest. Mm -hmm. um, this, was, this was, I think, 12 years before I was anything at all. Um, uh, my parents weren't married. My father was 12. But he'd met the redheaded girl of his dreams in the first grade of St. Francis, de, or fifth grade of St. Francis de Sales. Anyway, while my grandfather was discussing the boxes and bagpipers and mum plants, et cetera, with Mr. DeNoyer, my father wandered about the big old house until he came to a room where the door was ajar. And he looked inside and saw two men in striped trousers and white starchy shirts and gray ties and wingtip shoes who were vesting the dead priest, his uncle, in his liturgical vestments. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, they reached under the corpse and gathered them into their staggering embrace and sidestepped their way over to a box against the wall where they laid the priest carefully into it. And it was to that moment my father would always trace his intention uh, to become an undertaker. And I used to say to him when I'd hear this story, as we invariably did, why didn't you want to be a priest? Yeah. And he'd say, well, the priest was dead. My father yeah. wasn't a man given to much metaphor. And so <laughs> he, he went with the boys that were still standing. Yeah. Yeah, you would also think a 12-year-old would uh, be a little bit horrified by that sight, but it didn't seem that that way at all. Well, as I say, he'd already met the red-headed girl of his dreams, and so yeah. the mysteries of life and death had no doubt become co conversant with him. You yeah. Know? He would later go off and fight in the 1st Marine Division, um, seeing combat on Cape Gloucester and... Uh, in Okinawa and in China after the surrender of the Japanese. And then he came home and made babies and embalmed bodies and uh, lived until his 67th year, whereupon he died a tidy death on, a, uh, on his uh, holidays, his winter holidays in Florida. Yeah, and you go into some detail about uh, that whole ordeal, too, in the book. And maybe we'll, I have a question about that a, a little bit later. But uh, um, suffice to say, uh, I, I think it's very interesting, first of all, to find, uh, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, uh, to find somebody who is not only a mortician, especially at this interesting time where COVID has absolutely changed the game for so many people, but obviously certainly for your trade. Um, but also that you're uh, not just a mortician, but th that you're a poet and, and you're an author. Um, so, so much like your father's experience and the way in which he interpreted uh, that experience and felt calling from that moment rather than what I would think a much younger generation now would find horrifying, uh, you, you seem to be, if I may say, not only a renaissance man, but almost a uh, maybe this is not fair to say it this way, but Rip Van Winkle in that you're a blast from the past and that uh, the many hats that you wear uh, seem to me to be a bygone thing um, from from ages past. And I, th I thought that that might, would be interesting as well, just to, um, to kind of uh, talk to somebody who has had their hand in so, so many different things. Um, and so I, I think as we jump into some of that conversation, especially about the conversation about um, death, what that looks like um, uh, in this era. Um, I think we'll find some interesting things there. But perhaps if, if you don't mind, I want to ask a, a question that might be a little bit prying. I've already asked uh, some, some personal background questions, but, uh, but I want to just, just ask you this because I think it'll be interesting to my audience, but certainly it was interesting to me. Somebody who deals with death on a regular basis, as you have, uh, maybe this is akin to somebody who is a soldier in the military and they've seen things, or maybe even a police officer, they've seen things that the regular average person does not see on a regular basis. I would think somebody, and I could be wrong about this, but that somebody that, that deals with death as, as you have for, for, how many years have you been a mortician? I'd say 50. 50, wow. Okay. So for 50 years, um, one of two things could typically happen. Either you could become increasingly cynical or you could become very deeply spiritual. 
So how do you feel being a mortician has shaped your life? Uh, is it one of those two things or maybe is it a, a third option? Well, I want to say, first of all, about the hats, it's because I'm bald and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I have a lot of hats because like up, I'm up north now on a lake where I live alone with a dog as a kind of quarantine, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it's as nice a day as it is, it's still coolish for a man with no hair on his head. I so, understood. Um, uh, but as to whether or not you become cynical or spirit, first, I should also explain that for a year now, I've been up here in this place uh, at my son who runs our, Michael, uh, runs our, uh, our uh, firm in Milford and in Brighton. And I'm in, you know, fairly regular touch with him. I still write obituaries and stuff like that. Sure. Um, but I am, as he says, not retired, but not required. So I can... Yeah pretty much do what I want and have done for uh, maybe six or eight years now, since he said, you can, you know, you've, you've given your 50 years to this work and maybe you have another, maybe you'd like to, you know, I think he was trying to get me out of the office next to his so that he could, you know, <laughs> he could follow his own best instincts, which I've come to find out are better than my own. Yeah. Not, neither of us, however, got to the point where it felt like a racket. Um, ours, we always referred to it as funeral service. And it's mostly because my father used to say, if you take care of the service, the sales will take care of themselves. I love that. Yeah, I like it too, because it, it puts the onus on the delivery of, of a kindness to people who call you at tough times. And uh, I, I, I've noticed, Reed, that whether I've become more spiritual or more cynical, I do know that for the first time in my adult life, really, my schedule is mine. Hmm. So, so that, um, I mean, it used to be if someone in Milford died, I knew what I'd be doing for the next few days. And right. in as much as someone... I mean, the numbers on mortality are fairly convincing. They hover right around 100%. So eventually, someone's going to die every day. <laughs> That's true. And, uh, so my schedule was always sort of determined by the uh, mortuary uh, requirements of my community. I was the only funeral director in town. And, um, and uh, so I suppose that gives you a place from which you could have taken more advantage or you could have become more estranged it would become routine it never did i found that the only way to keep sane about uh, mortality was to be fully engaged with the families hmm. with whom your life intersected at this very difficult time in their family history and having now achieved an age where uh, uh death has become not only um part of my professional experience but um, a big part of my personal experience in terms of uh, people that I love who I've outlived. Um, I find that it's, it's probably better to um, uh, show up, pitch in and do your part, whatever that happens to be. So many, hot, many hats notwithstanding, what I usually tell people who ask me questions is, you know, I'm good at embalming bodies and writing sonnets. And I'm happy to take questions on anything between those two uh, enterprises. Um, um, and there's no such thing as a silly question, nor can my feelings be much hurt anymore. I've, you know, I've raised teenagers. And um, <laughs> so that work is done. So I'll be happy to, you know, answer uh, anything. I can say that I think I've become over time, I might have won some of the battles between begrudgery and gratitude, mm. by which I mean, for example, um, that I'm more inclined to, to um, gratitude, to give thanks than to, you know, to give out with my uh, begrudgeries or resentments or grievances. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> I I um I don't know I I'm not um, 
as aged and wise as you yet, but uh, but I feel that. Um, I think I think the older that I get, the more gratitude becomes um, more common to me, and I and it seems to me more and more, especially. And we could probably go on and on about this, but it seems to me, especially now and in, in this generation. Um, as uh, younger people move into adulthood, how uh, entitlement becomes so so common. Uh, so I definitely think that gratitude as uh, <clears throat> comes with age. Uh, so uh, so that's that's interesting. I can imagine how too that perhaps has been communicated to you through um, some of your experiences as a mortician. Um, so I'm also interested in your transition from mortician to author. I'm in the I'm in the process right now of writing my first ever book, and perhaps that's not fair. I've probably tried to write a couple of different books, but never gotten to the finish line. But this is the first one that uh, um, that I will finish. Um, so uh, what what's that been like for you? That the transition from mortician to to author? Well, it never felt like I. There was no transition involved. I mean, I, I, I didn't feel like it was. Um, I felt like I could do both of them full time. Hmm. I couldn't be sort of a half funeral director. Yeah. And a half author, I wouldn't want to be either. So, what happened was I had to find a way in which one contributed to the other. And so I, um, for for reasons that are not entirely known to me. I wrote a lot of poetry. I read a lot of poetry and what happened, I mean, I think writers are sort of readers who go karaoke, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they hear a tune, you know, from uh, Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost or W.B. Yeats or whomever it might be. And they say, I could do that, or I'd like to try that. I know in my own case, I had a, a university uh, professor, Michael Heffernan, who was, uh, committing poetry on a daily basis and uh, we used to drink a lot together because why not you know he was <laughs> he was an Irish Catholic so was I and we yeah. were both fairly lapsed but we knew how to drink and and he was a uh, uh, we were both uh, single men and he lived uh, in a rental property and uh, so we'd get together and talk about uh, William Carlos Williams and Walt Whitman and and uh Emerson and Thoreau, and while we were at it, we drink as much whiskey as we possibly could. It was encountering on the desk in his house uh, several poems in typescript uh, that made me think, oh, this is a living poet. He was really the first living poet I knew because among the things that was required of poets to be taken seriously in those days was that they'd be dead, a thing I was unwilling to do. I was only 20 or 19 or something. so. Um, but Heffernan was alive and well and writing poems that really, you know, took my breath away, if you want to know the truth. They were gorgeous and startling poems. And I remember when I got his first little volume of poetry, uh, The Cry of Oliver Hardy, it was called. And I looked at it and I thought, these poems are going to outlive him. Mm. And I, I, I think I made a proper assessment then and now about that. He's a marvelous poet and internationally ignored as most poets are, or as my young assistant says, you're all minor poets. It's regarded as a minor art. Mm. And it's true. We, we like poetry for, you know, when they knock the trade towers down or, you know, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, it's nice to know that we have poetry in the way that it's nice to know about good drinking water. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We like the infrastructure, but we just don't want to read any poems. You know? <laughs> right. But I'm, I'm one of those people who reads poems and um, I can't memorize much of them, but I have to, so I have to keep going back and reading more and more and more. So, yeah. um, and after I'd written a book of poems, the man who published those poems, Gordon Lish, then with the house of Alfred Knopp, uh, called me up on the phone and said, I was at the office at the time. And I remember standing in the front office and he called, he said, do you ever write anything besides poetry? And I said, well, no, but I could, you know, I, you know. He says, well, okay, write me something about 3,000 words in 
in sentences and paragraphs. And if you if it's good, I'll publish it in a very important literary magazine, which I sort of took to mean um, I wouldn't be getting paid and no one would read it, which gives <laughs> a great, great deal of it. Yeah. But so but after a while, um, I kept trying to write this thing and nothing came. And so I finally called him back in his offices in New York. I said, Lish, what is it you want me to write? He said, I don't care. Just write. Just do it. He said, tell, tell us what it is you do. And read this. I don't know if you've ever belonged to a Rotary Club. Mm -hmm. hmm. A few people I talk to do, but the Rotary Club was then and remains sort of a civic organization, a Main Street, uh, in those days, an entirely men's organization that they would have dinner once a week and talk about the millage vote and the, you know, the whatever came to mind. And they'd always have a program. It lasted about 15 minutes. And the program would give them cover for their, you know, for their drinking and their jokes and the, and the overeating they did. And, um, I say they, I mean we. And um, uh, whenever the program uh, manager didn't get a program, then they would require one of the local Rotarians to give a what they called a classification speech. Mm -hmm. And it's because it was only one of every professional or occupational sort in the group. They had one real estate agent, you know, one uh, clergy person one astronaut, one serial killer, one disc jockey, and one funeral director. I was every day. So whenever I had to give a classification speech, whenever I had to tell them what it is I do, I'd stand up and I'd say, well, every year I bury a couple hundred of my townspeople. Hmm. I, and I cremate a good few of them too. And so that became the first sentence for the essay, the first essay I wrote for Gordon Lish, which he did publish and didn't pay for but it gave me access, a toe in the door of a form that I'd never really examined before. And by the time I had a book of those, I had an editor who wanted to publish them. Mm -hmm. And then one who wanted to publish it in London and one who wanted to publish it in uh, China and one who wanted to publish it in Italy. And so I became internationally unknown, which for writers is better than <laughs> just locally unknown. Yeah. Yeah, I heard you say this, too, that one of the things that you need to do before you start writing is to throw away every sense of becoming a hack, something like that. Um, and then recognizing, too, that everybody who's an author doesn't bring their second best casserole. They, they bring their best. So um, uh, so I, uh, I right, could definitely... They think it's going to be in the library, so they want it to really be good. Yeah, yeah. People are going to be tasting it, so they want it, they want it to taste good, for sure. Yeah. Um, now, I do have to ask this. Forgive me. I, I want to jump to some other things um, that I think will uh, that I think you'll shine some interesting light on. But I, but I do have to move to where my mind typically goes. Um, I, I'm a trained philosopher um, by academic trade, which means I am poor um, and useless, except for perhaps writing uh, writing a book if I can ever finish it. Um, but so my mind moves to uh, the metaphysical, the existential, and I, I, I do have to ask this because ultimately th th this really is why um, I think you can shine some light on on uh, on us, especially at this stage in the game. And by us, I mean humanity. Um, when you deal with death a lot, it, I think it probably gives you some perspective. So I can't help but wonder this. Did your desire or at least your inclination to begin writing, and by the way, you're a fantastic author. Um, uh, so did you, you just say, I'm a really good embalmer too. <laughs> uh, you really are a good writer. Um, but is is it is perhaps the reason behind the writing, does, is there a connection to the mortician trade? Is there a sense in which we crave permanence. We walk around in this malaise, I think all of us, trying to absolutely avoid the conversation of death and certainly trying to avoid death as a reality unless it just is absolutely thrust upon us. Um, when you're dealing with it, as you have on a regular basis, I wonder if there isn't some sense of uh, desire for a voice after this life uh, to, to be heard, and, and maybe does that motivate some of your writing? Yes. 
<laughs> I, 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 I did want, I remember early on thinking, if I write a book of poems and it goes on the shelf and it will outlive me, then someday my children, who will no doubt wonder what I was thinking about when I should have been listening to them, <laughs> when my gaze sort of strayed to their ear, yeah, instead of looking them in the eyes, when they could tell I was not paying my full attention to them, I wanted them to know what was going on with me and mm. the poems, the counting of syllables and lines and the sound of words was what was going on with me. I was absolutely entranced by the language. Mm. And too often the language I was imagining was better, at least in my brain box, to be hearing than the language that everyday life gives you. Now, there are many exceptions to that. There are found poems. Mm -hmm. And the, what I have found is that the writing of words tunes you to language in all its incarnations. Yeah. That's the good news and the bad news, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think there's probably a sense in which all of us, maybe even subconsciously, are trying to achieve some aspect of of permanence in an impermanent world. Um, and perhaps that leads us to the next question, which is really kind of one of the bigger questions that I wanted to, to talk to you about. Ultimately, um, the main thing being just this kind of conversation, if you want to call it that, with death that, that our culture is having more so than ever before, I think because of COVID, uh, but also because I just believe generally speaking that we can gain great value from death. And so here's here's what I mean by that. As morbid as a statement that as that may be, here's what I mean by that. In the undertaking, you go on for a bit illustrating the idea that the dead don't care. Um, now, when I read that, uh, essentially I thought you were per perhaps meaning two things. Uh, essentially uh, illustrating the fact that we have very superstitious ideas about death. Um, we have kind of an awkward relationship, if you want to call it that, with, with death. And so we think very often that uh, uh, father would care about what his hair looked like or what the suit looked like, which suit he was wearing and all that stuff, when the reality is, is, is that funerals, and this is probably the second thing, that funerals are, are more about the living than they are about the dead. Um, I would say that that's probably a fair statement, but this is what you said in um, in, a, in an excerpt of of your book, the, the Depositions. You said this, and as I watch my generation labor to give their teenagers and young adults some family values between courses of pizza and Big Macs, I think maybe Gladstone had it right. I think my father did. They understood that the meaning of life is connected inextricably to the meaning of death. That mourning is a romance in reverse, and if you love, you grieve, and there are no exceptions, only those who do it well and those who don't. And if death is regarded as an embarrassment or an inconvenience, if the dead are regarded as a nuisance from whom we seek a hurried riddance, then life and the living are in for like treatment. McFunerals, McFamilies, McMarriage, marriage, McValues. Um, and then you go on, but, but it reminds me of a quote from Charles Swindoll. He said that death is one of life's greatest teachers. So what do you suppose, and, and maybe this is more specific to you, but, but also you wrote a book about it. What do you suppose death has taught you about life and what can death teach us about life? What are some of those big lessons that you would say that you've learned as a mortician? Well, I'll give you a couple. Uh, the ones that I'm, I'm, you know, have survived the test of my time anyway. One is that um, is that a good funeral is one that by getting the dead where they need to go, the living get where they need to be. Mm. So we we've heard about the thirty seven stages of this grief and that grief. We've heard about. Uh, all the things we have to do in order to do mourning correctly. Um, but I think showing up, pitching in, doing your part is a big part of getting through a death in the family. Death in the, in the 
pandemic sense, yeah. in the half a million deaths, in the uh, tens of thousands that were killed at Hiroshima or Nagasaki, or the, you know, the, the dead in their anonymous multitude. We handle that just fine. We, we, we just move along. The obituaries are the harder part mm. because we find we not only hear who died and how they died, but how they lived, if the, obituary, yeah. if the obituary is any good. So by getting the dead where they need to go, the living will generally find their way to where they need to be in relation to the dead. So when I said the dead don't care, I think maybe the dead really do matter. Yeah. They don't care. I just was thinking, I've never heard anybody say, I want the oak casket, not the... Uh, uh, not the uh, cherry one. I've never heard anybody say I want the pinstripe suit, and you know, and not the seersucker. The the dead are silent. That's their major language, and so the mystery of death is best, I think, encountered by sitting in silence, mm. in the maw of that mystery, and seeing what comes to you. And I believe that I, there's a lovely term used by. I was teaching in a theology department in Atlanta for a year. And one of the terms I heard from the Methodist and Presbyterian uh, uh, seminarians was uh, our cloud of witnesses. And I'm a devoutly lapsed Catholic uh, and I haven't a clue about what's next. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm disinclined to the, you know, all the structures of the afterlife that are promulgated by the bishops and cardinals of any stripe. But I do believe that the dead matter to the living and that we are trying to, we are trying to achieve a reconciliation in memory with our cloud of witnesses. And our cloud of witnesses can be very noisy some days silent the other days yeah. and um so i think we process mortality you're a philosopher so you understand the difference between the idea of the thing and the thing itself yeah so when bishop barclay said you know if the tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it did it happen that's a i mean i think he was using it to leverage the belief in a deity that observes everything yeah but I mean, it's a good question. If no one cares that someone dies, who cares? Right. So this helped me to begin to see certain in my life as a funeral director, uh, certain essential aspects of funer funerary practices that across cultures and across uh, centuries and across uh, different religious sensibilities were true regardless of where it happened when it happened or to whom it happened yeah and what what i found reed was that the corpse is not incidental mm. to this it's sort of like it's it's it is exactly the same as the baby at a baptism the naming and claiming ceremonies we do right or the bride and groom at their wedding you can't you can't do that by proxy. Yes. There is not a virtual event that'll take up the, the emotional distance. And certainly between births and, and marriages and deaths, death is the one that we, you know, we wonder about because we don't, we don't see how it plays out, but we process mortality by processing. See how that works in our lexicon? Yeah. Mortal. We process our dead from one station to another. And the corpse is essential. The mourners are essential because without them, who cares? Right. You know, we're, 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 we're sort of human roadkill. And, and humanity has endured incidents of human roadkill. In a sense, the pandemic is giving us the opportunity to treat a half a million deaths in a year as human roadkill, hmm. except for the ones we know. Right. Right. And, um, and unless we, unless we, as a culture, as a, as a civic initiative, say this happened to 
all of us and pause and think about it you know we we are we are treating ourselves like cocker spaniels and rhododendrons other living things that die but do not pause as we do for the for the corpse the mourners and the story this is the most important part as a philosopher you'll get this unless the people who are trying to process the idea of death have a story about the dead thing and it better be a pretty nimble story a very sturdy one right this is, this is why religion does so well in our species because religion provides a narrative yeah. arc for what happened here that's, that's right. right and uh but without that we're left to you know nana made good chocolate chip cookies <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. pop pop always cheated at golf <laughs> that's not the story i'm talking about yeah i'm on. not talking the story of foibles and and uh, you know friendly stories i'm talking about the story of what, grand they believed, yeah, what they believed and hoped for and cared about and would you know would walk on water to get to yeah you know so and then then you know, so corpse, mourners, story, and finally transport. We have to get them out of here because this, and you can try this at home. We can live with a broken heart. Many of us are or will. We can live with a shaken faith. Many of us are or will. But we can't live with a dead guy on the floor. And you can try this at home. And the reason we can is because they begin to smell. That's why I'm in business. Yeah. People call me in the middle of the night uh, to say, you know, come help. Because a death in the family still feels like an emergency. But it's very much like a birth in the family. It's a changeling. Yeah. We have to learn how to live with what elements of it we can. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I would say... In a similar fashion, my kind of my kind of input as far as that's concerned, but that was well said, is that uh, as a truly devout Christian evangelical, um, I would say Christianity. I don't know if I would say at its worst, but Christianity certainly, in its most minor state, is to assure an individual that they will go to heaven. So it's that that question of the afterlife. Uh, but the vast, the vast, much more substantial part of Christianity is that it, it, it. Yes, it makes helps you make sense of death, but it helps you make sense of life. Why are you here? What's your purpose? Why even exist? Um, and and I think that uh, that that's important to note. There's there's an old way of, of maybe a cliche way of saying this. We say that. If you were created to go to heaven, then when you got saved, Jesus would take you there. But he left you here for a reason. He left you here for a purpose. Um, and ultimately, I would say that I, that I would agree with Charles Swindoll and some of what you just said, that in order to make sense of this life, in order to find meaning, uh, it's important that we look at death, but that we also, uh, and, and that we, we honor the dead. And, but that we also understand that there is um, that it's coming for us, and that there is there is room, time, and purpose for us while we are here. And looking at death as much as we hate to do it helps us remember that. I think death uh, does teach us some important things about respecting and honoring this precious life that we've been given. And did you ever wonder? I'm I'm trafficking in a a new heresy involving Trumpism and Christianity. <laughs> okay. Uh, that being this, that Christianity, if nothing else, prepares people for the big lies or for, you know, magical thinking. What is Christianity? The sense that Jesus rose from the dead, but a kind of magical thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, we live, if we live by faith, he rose from the dead, full stop. And as Paul says, if we don't believe that, the rest is, you know... Um, but in some ways, I've often wondered why it is that evangelical Christians are so willing to believe the big lies that our erstwhile president, I think he's been called the former guy now, why are they willing to believe in that? Yeah. When the, the math is evident, the courts have spoken, you know, 
people of reliable reputation have said, no, actually we counted it once, twice, three, four times, and it always comes out the same. Yeah. He didn't win. Yeah. And yet, as you know yourself, there are, I mean, half the men in my Bible study um, believe he's the, um, he's the proper president of the United States in the much the same way as they claim to see Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Yeah. Yeah, you probably know the answer to that, but I would say there's probably a couple different answers. Uh, is though I haven't a clue. <laughs> well, I think uh, well, dead priest, you know. <laughs> there's two things. One, I would uh, I would caution uh, creating the same kind of uh, rationale around the resurrection as I would the election of Donald Trump, because I think that that two. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I think the two are Me very too. different. And I was um, doing that really well until Franklin Graham told me that anybody who voted to impeach Donald Trump was like Judas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, the I didn't The relation of Donald Trump with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did not start with the skeptics like me. Yeah. They started with someone with such great religious pedigree that people took him seriously. Yeah. But, and I think the, the, the other thing is just simply this, and this makes room for the, uh, the Graham quote, is that people are not uh, rational thinkers by and large. Uh, I know even even a astute man like yourself, uh, I think we could probably agree that there are some things that we rationally deduce, and then there are some things that we emotionally deduce. And uh, the vast majority of people, um, if I were to put myself in their shoes, because actually, even though I may be an evangelical Christian, I, I actually like evidence, and I think that there was nominal evidence of... Um, issues with the election, but nowhere near enough to actually overturn an election. Uh, so I think um, I, I'd have to put myself in their shoes and just say that I think Christians sympathized with him so much that they closed their eyes to the reality of some of their more logical capacities because they felt like in Donald Trump, they for the first time had a president that sympathized with them, cared about them, and was fighting the same fight. So I think that that caused many, many, many of them. Not, I don't believe, uh, I think it's bad press to say that this is endemic to religious people or to Christians, that they do not think logically. I think that's a lie. Um, uh, that's, that's just not true. called it a heresy. It is a heresy. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's just that people allowed themselves to be blinded, um, and I think that that's probably true of a lot of things. Like, and maybe you can you can sympathize with this from the mortician trait, is that there's there's a lot of selective memory when it comes to remembering someone who who is dead. Um, uh, sometimes uh, there's there's a lot of glossing over some of the exactly uh, right. You're exactly right. That's why the feast of the Epiphany is underrated in the uh, Christian. Uh, liturgical calendar because it is the feast of seeing things as they are. Yeah. Most people, when they look at the poor um, naked man on the cross who was being executed for having raised somebody else from the dead, a thing you don't want to go around doing in Judea, apparently, because right. word gets out, you know. It's bad enough that he was he healing paralytics and lepers and the rest, but raising them from the dead, that <laughs> we're not going to put up with. Yeah. And it was, it was a, a direct line between that and the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many people didn't see it as saving us from our sinfulness. They saw it as him getting his comeuppance. Right. In much the same way, in much the same way as the wise men from the East happening upon the poor family in the stable said, you know, if the wise men said, oh, this is the king of the world. Mm -hmm. 99 out of every hundred sentient other people would have said, you know, that's not a great start. That's not an auspicious beginning. <laughs> right. We ought to wrap that baby up and get him some food. Yeah. So the epiphany it is the feast of seeing things as they are. And maybe that's why, maybe that's why the epiphany, our civic epiphany happened as it did this last January 6th, when many Christians, many believers, and many belongers um, <clears throat> invaded the, the Capitol 
in pursuit of a further presidency of Donald Trump, mm -hmm. not because they wanted to make America great again, but because they wanted to be sure America remained white again. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, my own bias is, and I'm older than you, so I've lived through 70 some years of, um, of our civic life. And I never remember a question about who won mm. ever until this past November. Well, wouldn't you, what about uh, 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 Gore Bush? Yeah, the, the, you'll remember that Gore, Gore conceded that. And then when they said, oh, Florida's vote is up in there, they said, well, count them up and then we'll see. And they went to the courts and they went here and there and they, they went through civic procedures. Yeah. But I, I'm going to suggest to you that the, the, the insurrection that we witnessed on all channels on January 6th was not going to the Supreme Court or, or counting the chads. That was a different <laughs> thing. Yes, it, yes. Yeah. And those people were not, uh, those people were not seeking redress. They were seeking power. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the fearsome thing is that just puts us back in with the, you know, the... Uh, the occupied Jews, the difference between, say, St. Peter, who was a zealot, and St. Matthew, who was a company guy. He was called a tax collector. Yeah. Both apostles of the same risen Savior, both true believers, and both, by the way, executed by civil authorities in their youth for what they believed. So what, what I'm saying is... Uh, we have to know the difference between what we know intellectually, what we know emotionally, and what we what we glimpse or discern spiritually. There right. is a difference. Yeah. And I'm not going to I'm not going to attribute to insurrectionists a spiritual directive. Yeah, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. But I would also say this that the same um the same thing that keeps me from jumping on board and endorsing such blind faith is the same thing that causes me to have faith in Christ. So I think this is an important distinction. I, I believe that Christianity has taught me that if I cannot disagree with myself, then, uh, then I don't actually care about the truth. If I can't see things from a yeah, if I can't see things from a different perspective, then I don't care about the truth and I don't care about Jesus. So I would argue, by the way, that uh, however many of those very small amount of number of people who were actually there in Washington, D.C. on the 6th, I know some Christians personally who were there, there were only 200 that stormed the Capitol. Of those 200, um, I, I, I think it would be fair to say that if any of them were professing evangelical Christians, that they were of the stripe that you are familiar and I am familiar with, who um, are so lapsed that they don't even understand what Christianity is any longer, because you could not be a good conscience Christian and participate in that kind of civil disobedience uh, that ended uh, the life of a, of a woman. And then there's, and, you, and, and we could go on and on and on. I about have that. to but, agree but the, with you. But the point is, is that uh, uh, you can't in good faith call yourself a, a, a good Christian, a Bible-believing Christian anyway. Um, but we also know that that exists, right? The vast, I mean, I've been a pastor for many, many years, for 18 years. The vast majority of people who come in to church, uh, you know, they're like people who go into to McDonald's. Just because they go into McDonald's doesn't make them a Big Mac. So very, very few people who profess faith in Christ, really even understand who Jesus is. So I think we have to put that in the equation as well. So there's people who... Go ahead. This is why we rely on the text. Yeah. So when John says, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him, love seems to have a lot to do with it. Trouble is, um, we, we, we disguise a lot of love, apparently, because... <laughs> we do. And that's why I say it's very hard to see a loving God in much of what happens in, in the name of God. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is where your trade as a philosopher and pastor and my trade as a funeral director and poet have a lot of, in common. We wonder. We're contrarian on a lot of things. Yeah. And this is why the great Irish poet Yeats said, 
uh, of the quarrel with others, um, we make um, uh, prose. Mm -hmm. And of the quarrel with ourselves, we make poetry. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you for myself, most of what it has been for me, the writing of poetry, is to figure out what it is I glimpse, mm -hmm. what it is I see of uh, the creator's intentions for me. Yeah. And uh, it's, you know, it's a lifelong battle to get my will aligned with the will of whomever's in charge here because I'm constantly wanting to be in charge, and yeah. I'm not, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, I, I always think of the Pope this week going to see the Ayatollah. I know there are good Christians who are saying, way to go, you Pope, or way to, and I know there's plenty of Muslims saying, way to go, you Ayatollah, but I know there are as many who are sharpening the knives and saying, you shouldn't have been there. Yeah. You, you can't give credit to that line of belief. Yeah. We're not all in this together. We're not all God's children just trying to find our way back home. I know that those people exist. Sure. And many of them were at the Capitol on the 6th. Yeah, for sure. But but again, we we also know that those people exist. Like for instance, I I have this quote here. Um, and by the saying those people exist, be very clear and just say, um, we, there are people who make things up as they go along, have no true standard by which they live their life. And again, this is where I think faith in Christ and, uh, faith in a text helps you with, with this. But, uh, but this goes full circle back into kind of the conversation about death that we've been having throughout. Um, J.K. Rowling, who I would suggest is a, is a smart woman, uh, said this, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Now, the problem with that quote is this, is that how in God's name does she know <laughs> that death is the next great adventure? Because uh, without anything existential, metaphysical, without a grand narrative, um, of which I obviously choose to to draw from Scripture and from the teachings of Christ, the death is just death, right? There is nothing outside of that. What she's saying outside of a grand narrative makes absolutely zero sense. But this is the way the vast majority of us live our life. And if we're not careful, even as poets, sometimes we can over-poeticize, whatever that word would be, um, we can make something more poetical than, than, than it actually is. The reality is, is that um, we have to have a firm grip upon life and upon what we value and upon what we think is true. Um, and so there, ha there has to be that grand narrative, I would say, that you, that you mentioned a while back. In order to draw meaning from, from this life outside of it, we're just making it up as we go along. No, well, that's what poets do. They make it up as they go along. <laughs> sure. And but I would I would posit the notion that possibly that's part of the part of the reasons why J.K. Rawlings says death is the next adventure. Mm -hmm. That she has faith. That she has faith in the human ability to make to take a day at a time and make things up as they go along. So if I believe that my father who's been dead for 25 years and my mother who's been dead longer than he has or my daughter who died last summer if i believe that they still know my heart and know my hope to see them again and know the longing i have to um be happy with them and be well with them to be healed with them and to be whole again with them if i believe that i'm believe i am saying essentially what jk rawlings is saying which is there's another adventure it's yeah. the same it's the same read as the pastor who stands at the bedside of the dead and says to the mourners who are just beginning to learn what mourning feels like behold i show you a mystery we shall not all slumber and sleep. And um, I say guys like that and women like that are very courageous because 
when I've heard that, sometimes I felt I had like a deck that song because I just feel terrible. I've been I've been in the funeral home where uh, a truly holy man, Joe Girard, the bed of heaven to him, an Episcopal deacon, said to a grieving mother at the casket of her dead daughter. Oh, don't worry, Martha, that's just her shell. Right. And she slapped him, knocked him down. I remember reading that. Yeah. And what she was saying is, it's my job to tell you when it's just the anything. Until I tell you otherwise, that's my daughter. And don't take that from me. That's why the half a million COVID deaths, most of which occurred in intensive care out of eye shot, ear shot, or uh, arms reach of the people who most love them is so brutal because it removed from us the choice to at least move the deck chairs around the Titanic. Mm. We're, 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 we have no choice about death. Uh, suffice to say, um, a absolutely riveting conversation. I think we probably go on and on and continue to talk about uh, how COVID uh, has affected us nationally and uh, how there needs to be probably even kind of a, a, a national conversation about mortality um, and, and all of that. But uh, hopefully this in some way will uh, make a small dent in some of that conversation. Uh, suffice to say, uh, I would want my listeners to consider the importance of something that we touched on, just that uh, in order to answer metaphysical questions, there needs to be an authoritative source. That ultimately probably drives so much of, of where my faith lands and why I, why I am a believer. Um, and uh, throughout the conversation, hopefully, I think uh, giving people an opportunity to just to kind of think about life and mortality um, just from a, from a general perspective. So uh, I hope people will go out and get the book, uh, Bone Rosary. That's going to be uh, available by the time this uh, this podcast airs, and where can they get the book, uh, Thomas? I think they're they're bookshops and uh, they're online booksellers. the The nice part about buying books of poetry, any poetry, is yeah. you know those pesky relatives who seem to have everything when it comes to be their birthday or Christmas time. Yeah, they don't have this book. <laughs> that's true and likely they don't have any book of poetry so, so yeah and and we are people of the book as you know yourself yes sir uh, yeah so we can end that right now and we can go ahead and make sure that they do have this book so people can purchase that on amazon or wherever they get their books uh and uh and and i would say uh if nothing else maybe even we can push forward the idea that uh poetry is a uh, part of this great adventure we call life and even contemplating mortality. So uh, as you said before, that sometimes poets and philosophers run in similar circles in that they, they uh, try to ask these contrarian questions. And so poetry definitely helps you think about things from a different perspective, helps you think about life. Thank you, Reed. Well, thank you, Thomas, uh, for marrying, or I say marrying and burying, that's my job. But uh, thank you for burying uh, so many of your townspeople, being there through some of the darkest days of people's life. We're doing a lot of burning nowadays. I bet you are. Yes, I'm sure you are. Um, uh, but uh, but no, uh, obviously, an unheralded trade, but certainly something that every single one of us uh, need and are appreciative of, appreciative of when the time comes, which is another reason why you probably got into poetry, uh, because it's probably uh, true of, of poets as well. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being on, and uh, look forward to hopefully maybe even having you in the future. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our thanks again to our guests for being on the show today. Indie Thinker with Reed Uberman was brought to you by our sponsors. If you like what you heard today, please do us a big favor and give it a five-star review and like it and share it with friends. And if you want to hear more awesome guests, make sure to check out past episodes. Indie Thinker is a nonprofit paid for by our sponsors and the generous gifts of people like you. In order to hear more great guests like you did today, please consider giving a tax-deductible gift by going to IndieThinker.org. And just remember, your voice matters, but infinitely more when you think for yourself.